Podcasts are not a new medium. Having emerged in the early 2000s with the popularization of portable digital music players, but it's only recently that podcasts have taken off in Taiwan. Since 2019, this audio-only format has been favored by amateur content creators, internet celebrities, and even politicians. Tonight, in our Sunday special report, we dive into the exciting, thriving, and sometimes problematic world of Taiwanese podcasts. 大家好，欢迎收听三望原创节目《围剿女神拉拉链》，我是主持人美女作家李平遥。我们今天依旧请到了客座主持人严娜女士。Hi， 我是第一季、第二季、第三季都在的客座主持人严娜。In this small studio, a producer mans the console while two presenters sit at their mics. This is where the magic happens for one of the hottest podcasts on the internet. I've been doing this for about a year or so now. The whole process has been really interesting for me because before this, I was primarily a writer. I'm normally a writer as well. I do academic research. Both writers found themselves impacted by the pandemic in 2020. No longer able to hold book signings or interact with their readers, they found a new way to tell their stories. To their surprise, they were able to connect with their fans more than before. I feel like the podcast allows for very intimate programming. I hear from many people that they listen while cleaning their homes, working, or for some even while showering. Hosting a program like this, you'll receive a lot of feedback. I think that as a writer, many of my readers were shy, but after becoming listeners of the podcast, they gained the courage to share their thoughts and advice. Podcast 完全是用声音跟听众们播感情。With a podcast, you're relying completely on your voice to capture the listeners' hearts. It's refreshing because using your voice to express yourself is something that a writer normally can't do. Podcasts first came onto the scene in 2004, after the iPod popularized the use of portable devices to consume digital media. What makes it special is that users can listen anytime from their cell phones. They are not fettered by a broadcast schedule. Listeners also don't need to stare at the screens. All they have to do is listen. What kind of people listen to podcasts? Statistics show that the average listener is between 23 and 32 years old, and most hold a bachelor's or master's degree. 60% of listeners are women, and on average, listeners tune in for an hour at a time. One interesting finding we made is that among these listeners, a quarter of them have monthly salaries as high as fifty thousand NT dollars. So I think that one feature of the podcast audience profile is that perhaps they're shunning traditional entertainment, or they've grown wary of visual content and have turned to sound. Or maybe in the face of so much panic-inducing information out there, podcasts cast a ray of light. Why are podcasts interesting? Because their content is very diverse. Why are podcasts interesting? Well, it's because their content is diverse, and the files are easy to save and digest in pieces. You can replay the content and listen to it anytime, anywhere. It's because it's such a convenient format that listeners can connect with it under different circumstances in different environments. One platform that had 277 podcast programs in 2019 had over 8,000 programs in 2020. That represents a staggering 28-fold growth in just one year. In other words, there's been dramatic growth in the number of people producing podcasts. In the first quarter of last year, we had about 300 creators registered on the platform. In the first quarter of this year, that number soared to 2,900. I believe that number is about an eight-fold increase, give or take. One reason for the explosion in content creation is that it doesn't take much to get started. Whereas traditional broadcasting requires specialized equipment, making a podcast requires only a microphone and other recording equipment, a small soundproof space for recording, and editing software. With that, creators can make their own content and share it with the world. In traditional radio broadcasting, 
Most presenters are chosen through a testing process or interview, whether it's a special vocal quality, enunciation, manner of speaking, or professionalism. You've got to have something to get hired by a radio station and then to later become a presenter. Podcasting is something that more people want to get into. You just need to have the basic equipment and to put in a little time. That's all it takes to get started. Without the help of visuals, podcasts rely entirely on the program content. A podcaster's ability to speak naturally is very important. Herself a seasoned presenter of 17 years, Pan Yuechi now writes and works as a speech instructor. She's worked for a number of large organizations teaching staff. Now amid the rise of podcasts, there's been a huge increase in people hiring her to improve their speaking skills. I think what's important is to look at the category of the podcast and the expectations of listeners. For example, let's say there's a program about stock trading. When listeners are tuning into a program on finances, what do they want to hear? They don't care how beautiful the presenter's voice is. What they are looking for is information and whether the content is in touch with the times. However, if it is an intimate program for those looking for companionship, then the content has to give listeners a sense of warmth. Meanwhile, listeners of a program that makes music recommendations might place importance on the quality of the presenter's voice so that the whole program is easy to listen to. When assessing oral expression, listeners tend to mind factors like whether the enunciation is clear, whether the information is well articulated, and whether the voice is rich with expression. In a sea of 8,000 podcast programs, how does one stand out? And what does it take to reach the top five? Statistics show that the presenter's style and content are the crucial factors. Today, internet celebrity Froggy Chu, whose real name is Chiu Weijie, is a Taipei city councillor. He got his start on YouTube, where he racked up more than half a million subscribers. In 2020, he made the switch to podcasts. Seeking a new experience, Froggy made the transition from YouTube to podcasting and his program shot up to the top three. That popularity owed itself partially to Froggy's pre-existing status as an internet celebrity, but it was also due to his program's niche category. We talk about interesting news events. It can be enjoyed by scholars and laymen alike. Whether you have a graduate degree or you are still in high school, anyone can listen to this program without getting stressed out by the content. Also, these interesting news tidbits contain a certain degree of meaningful information too. <laughs> the show's topics are hot and nothing is taboo. The two presenters bounce off each other to comedic effect, keeping listeners glued to their headphones. When I was first conceptualizing this program, I decided I needed to have a woman as a co-host. I noticed that in a lot of countries, including the US and Taiwan, the programs that last the longest are usually hosted by not just one presenter, but two. What these young people want is a kind of resistance to society, maybe through ridicule or maybe satire. If you talk about sex or private matters, or speak in a politically incorrect way, that actually gets a lot of listeners. Young people might hear something they wouldn't normally say. They hear it, and they really resonate with it. Those things in the private sphere, I feel that those things are interesting. There are more and more podcasters who create an outlet for listeners' feelings, who have a brand based on their personality. But social media researchers warn that podcasts are a new form of media that's currently highly unregulated. The world of podcasts is wide and diverse, and that's the reason for the growing popularity. Yet creators still need to take responsibility for their content. In terms of laws protecting or regulating speech, there is certainly none of that unless you happen to say something that constitutes criminal behavior. However, in terms of health or science-related content or fake news, misinformation, unless these things constitute harm or a threat to safety, basically, they won't fall under any regulation.
Regulation becomes especially important for sensitive demographics. About 1.3% of podcast listeners are under 18, and only 11.3% are aged 18 to 22. Although they are not the core audience of podcasts today, the growth potential of these age groups cannot be underestimated. Many platforms like YouTube and Netflix have viewing restricted kids modes. Aside from YouTube, platforms like podcast apps, Spotify and Apple Podcasts have an indicator on many of their programs in the form of the letter E. That E stands for explicit, which means the program contains restricted content. You can go through the settings to manage the content so that these E-rated programs don't show up in the menu for child listeners. At this stage, we will continue to adopt a more open approach because to implement restrictions is a negative act. It treats the symptoms but not the root cause. Perhaps we can get to the root of it in a future software update to ensure the right content gets to the right age group, to the right users. This is actually something we plan to work hard on. Since 2019, YouTube has been disabling ads on potentially contentious content, preventing their creators from earning money. Their income affected, YouTubers naturally began adjusting their content to appeal to a larger audience. Free speech is protected, but if many people don't want to see negative content on audiovisual platforms, then naturally they will complain of injustice. And those complaints against injustice will affect advertisers. And the advertisers will in turn affect the platforms, which will make adjustments to the content to manage it. With the advance of technology, new forms of media emerge. New platforms come with new freedoms. But the question of how to manage content on these platforms is an unavoidable debate.